All right, thank you everybody for coming out tonight and taking time out of uh, what I know is your busy schedules to discuss some very important topics. As John said, I graduated here in 17. It's good to be back. Um, I now work as a union organizer in Pennsylvania. So let me just say off the bat, what I say tonight uh, reflects just my views, not that of my unions. So um, yeah, just a little disclaimer there. So the talk I've pre prepared for you tonight has two parts. The first part is really the subject of what was my academ academic research wallet case, which is the history of paramilitary groups in Colombia. And we're gonna trace that history to understand how Colombia got to where it is today. And the second part is that today portion. So the current political crisis in Colombia surrounding the peace process. And we're gonna look at that through the lens of a human rights delegation that I participated in in June of last year. So it's about 60 years of uh, Colombian history now less than half an hour. So I'm gonna try to be fast and I have a lot of words, but I wanna start with just one word. And that word is dictatorship. Okay, dictatorship. Dictatorship is a word we hear a lot when we uh, hear about Venezuela, right? We're told there's an evil dictatorship there where the government kills its own citizens with impunity and where millions starve. Let me say this. I've never been to Venezuela, I'll admit that. So I'll let those who have um, speak on that. But I'm Colombian. I um, lived there for, as, as a kid, uh, my family, my dad immigrated here in the 80s. Uh, I visit almost every year. I still have a ton of family down there. So the country I know is Colombia. And what that has meant for me is that all my life, I've had a very intimate relationship with a country whose government kills its own citizens with impunity and where millions starve, yet is never referred to as a, as a dictatorship, as is the case with its uh, neighbor Venezuela. So I'm not the first to notice this contradiction, you know? So because from the get-go for me, this, the, these discrepancies I've already explained to you, the, the meaning of this word never lined up. So there's a well-known Latin American author named Eduardo Galeano, who a while back coined the term democradura. So, di so dictatorship in Spanish means dictadura. So you can see he modified that dicta part and made it uh, democra dura. And what he's describing is, the ca is a case where there's a strong pretense of democracy, yet the government still functions as a dictatorship. So in my view, and what you'll see tonight is that Colombia really perfectly encapsulates this, this term de uh, democra dura. I wanted to include it too, because we're also going to be talking about Venezuela and U the late Hugo Chavez gave a, a book of Eduardo, de Gal of Eduardo Galeano that I recommend to you all called The Open Veins of Latin America when he met Obama. So to show how Colombia's a democratura, we're gonna look at some well-known cases of a dictatorship. The first one that might come to your head uh, in Latin America is Chile, you know, Augusto Pinochet, the fascist tyrant who came to power with help from the US in the 70s. So it's estimated that under Pinochet there are about 3,000 political killings. If we go a little bit to the east, or its neighbor, uh, Argentina, under the junta, there's an estimated 9,000 political killings in, um, in Argentina. So, so keep those numbers in your head. Because just in between the years 1988 and 1995, there are about 28,000 political killings in Colombia. None of that happened under military or dictatorship, or what would agree of dictatorship to, to be um, considered as. So that, the, that, that level of violence is why I think of Colombia as a democradura, right? Not a democracia, a democracy, Latin America's oldest and most stable democracy as you'll, as you'll often hear, hear referred to as. Um, so, yeah, and it's, it's worse. You know, there's been one, one unionist murder to the past, for every three days for the past 20 years. There's been 62,000 people displaced for the past uh, 50. So as with most things for me, I've, I view the root cause of this as economic. As these graphs show, uh, over the last, over the recent uh, years, Colombia's had um, substantial growth in its GDP, its uh, fixed capital formation, its um, foreign direct investment. But this is very much a capitalist model, and I'll get, I'll dig a little deeper into what I mean by that in a second. But the point is, is it's a very, very one-sided economic growth. The wealth has remained in the hands of, the, of a few. And today in Colombia, there are millions in poverty, millions of children are for, forced to work, millions are homeless. So that's par all part of what makes Colombia the 10th um, most unequal country in the world. So there are some obvious questions here, right? 
how is it, how is this, um, what makes this paradox possible? How has Colombia, uh, in, in theory, maintained liberal de democratic rule, um, mass amounts of violence and economic growth all, all at the same time? Um, and what I think you'll see is that Colombia, the Colombian state has been able to do this by using both official, its army police force, and un unofficial paramilitary groups to violently repress its population to preserve the status quo. So to best explain this, I'm gonna trace the history of the, of the paramilitary groups and the state. And this history shows that their relationship, the Colombian state and paramilitary groups, is indeed a collaborative partnership. And they've collaborated with the full backing of the US government to carry out some really awful atrocities. But first, what exactly are paramilitary groups? Paramilitaries are armed groups created and funded by wealthy sectors of society uh, whose principal aim is to um, eliminate, neutralize anybody who poses a threat to the ruling class and their accumulation of, of wealth and power. And their, um, the paramilitary groups in the state have from the beginning shared the same uh, internal enemy, what they'll claim, is what they claim to be fighting. And it, originally in the 60s, that was communism. Then in the 80s, it became drug trafficking. And the, then most recently, the, that official enemy has become terrorism. So if we think about the, uh, the title of the event tonight, U.S. Intervention in Latin America, or uh, Venezuela and Colombia, um, you'll notice that these official enemies line up really well with our own government's official enemies. So when we're thinking about how our tax dollars go to affect these situations and how the actions of our government uh, exacerbate these crises, that, this is really the, the first evidence of that that we're talking about tonight. So what's, imp what's most important, though, is that we all, we all take into account that just as we know with our you know, mil militarization, that the people these, mil these armed forces have targeted have never just been the drug traffickers, have never just been the communists, have never just been the terrorists, whoever they may be. In Colombia, the, their armed forces, the paramilitary groups, with, with support from the United States, have um, killed labor leaders, leaders of other social causes, eliminated leftist political candidates, intimidated reporters, displaced rural populations, and engaged in social cleansing. That, that's the reality we're dealing with here. And, and this violence, this mass amount of violence, isn't a secret. I'm not, I'm not exposing some, some um, you know, something that's been well hidden. Uh, you, can, you can look it up, it's often denounced, it's, you know, we, we talk about this is, a, this is awful. But what I do think I can help expose is this historical function, because that is something that's often, uh, in my opinion, under underestimated and um, and misunderstood. So the common historical narrative of paramilitary groups in Colombia is that they came about in the 80s as a response to the uh, seemingly unchecked growth of Marxist guerrillas, um, most, no most notably the FARC. And what this dominant analysis essentially claims is that paramilitaries are just a natural outcome of a state who's in unable to stabilize its territory and uh, limit access of, uh, to weapons to uh, private groups. But those of us who want to get to the root cause of things know that we can't just accept things as natural outcomes, right? We have to look at the class interests of the actors involved. Who benefits from this violence? When we do that, when we look at the Columbia case and we see a, a tiny elite living in opulence and a ma vast majority uh, impoverished, and every time that they try to advance uh, their cause, that they're, they're beat down, um, we see that, there's, that there really is a systemic function to paramilitary groups. And, and what that systemic function is of paramilitary groups, and with the help of the state, is to violently coerce the Colombian working class into capitalist social relations through dispossession and repression. Now, I want to say that again because that's really the heart of my argument. And it's, I guess, the more theoretical part, so I'll take a second to explain it more. 
So what I'm saying is paramilitary groups violently coerce through dispossession and, and repression the Colombian working class into capitalist social relations. So I know that sounds kind of abstract, but it's, it's very material, and I'll, I'll explain why. What is, so what does capitalist social relations mean? Well, the system we live under is, is capitalism. That's the economic system we live under, okay? But what it's defined by is really its existence as a social relation, okay? It's not the Protestant work ethic, supply, demand, uh, you know, value, I don't, whatever you know, your professors are telling you. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's really this, this social relation that we all experience in this room every day, whereas we have to sell our labor power to survive, right? We all enter into that relationship. In other words, I have to go to work to buy food so I can um, you know, survive, essentially. And for that relation to exist, there have to be some really important things that happen first or at the same time in order to maintain that. And those two things are, as I say, dispossession and repression. I have to be dispossessed from my land so that I can't live off it, I can't sell the small crops that I grow, so I have no other choice but sell, to sell my labor power. And then there has to be an element of repression because I have to be disciplined to accept the working conditions imposed on, on me by my boss. And I'm saying me here, but this is all of us, right? I don't see you know, any, I don't, um, Jeff Bezos, are, are you here? No, <laughs> right, so this is all of us. Um, we, all, we all enter into this social relation and we're just investigating how this comes about in, in Colombia here tonight. So, um, like I said, Colombia paramilitary groups are that armed branch of the ruling class to reproduce capitalism through dispossession in um, repression. So that's the theoretical portion to it. If you have any questions of that, if I didn't explain it well, we can talk in the Q&A. But now let's get into the history of Colombia. Um, so I want to explore three historical moments to not only document the history of the paramil paramilitary state relationship, but also um, prove this thesis regarding the nature of the relationship between paramilitaries and the state. So the first moment um, being the point of origin, where it all begins with the Plan Lasso, when the Colombian government originally creates paramilitary groups. The second being the point of transformation in the 80s with the advent of the drug trade. And the third moment being the point of ascension uh, in 2002 when Alvaro, Alvaro Uribe is elected as the country's president. Because as you'll see, Uribe is really the embodiment of this paramilitary state partnership. So in the point of origin, Pla um, Plan Lasso was a strategy formulated by the Colombian state with US advisors, which created the first official paramilitary groups and allowed for the legal, structural, and ideological justification of more paramilitary groups in the future. One of Plan Lasso's key tenets was the arming of civilians in order to engage in irregular war. The general uh, in the Colombian army, Albert Alberto Ruiz Novoa, who designed Plan Lasso, had been the commander of the Colombian battalion sent in the Korean War to fight uh, with the US, the, actually the only Latin American country to do that. In Korea, uh, Ruiz had not only gained a fierce anti-communist ideology, but observed the effectiveness of armed civilians who could provide local knowledge and fight alongside mil military units. In 1962, Ruiz became the highest commander of the armed forces as the Minister, Defen as the Minister of Defense, and on July 1st, 1962, Plan Lhasa was formally adopted by the Colombian military. Part of Plan Lhasa was a number of military decrees, one of the most important being Decree 3398, that gave the Ministry of Defense permission to arm and support civilians in the same way it would its national army. In 1968, Dec Decree 3398 was adopted as a law with the passage of Law 48 that allowed the executive branch to create um, civil defense patrols. So although the president never authorized any of the civil defense patrols, in court proceedings from then on, you know, even into the present, that is always used by the paramilitaries to give themselves legal justification. Um, so that takes us to the second point, or second moment, so to speak. That's what I call the point of transformation. And what this shows is how the expansion of the drug trade impacted paramilitary groups in Colombia. And 
What the rise of drug trafficking did in Colombia was not increase paramilitary groups because it expanded the illegal economy, thus giving private groups increased access to armed force, but rather paramilitary groups, paramilitary groups increased as drug traffickers themselves and by way of that became another segment of the capitalist class. So as the traffickers made their money through drugs, they invested those profits in um, the um, in hundreds of acres of land for livestock and other um, economic ventures. And by that process, their interest became the same as that of the um, previously existing landowning class. So it, just to give you a sense of this, in the five years between 1983 and 1988, drug traffickers, mostly them being leaders of paramilitary groups as well, bought more land than the government's Institute for Agrarian Reform had bought for land redistribution in 20 years. So this purchase of large amounts of land coincided with the creation of paramilitary groups and even the hiring of British and Israeli mercenaries to come and train them. One of the largest from this time period was MAS, um, which stands for uh, MAS, Muerte a Sequestradores, that translates to death to kidnappers. And that's important because during this time in the 80s, the Colombian government enters into peace negotiations with the um, guerrillas, the FARC. And out of the negotiations, a more moderate wing of the FARC completely demobilizes, gives up their weapons, and um, says, we want to you know, participate in, 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 in politics in, you know, without guns or any, any of that revolution stuff. So, they formed this party called the UP, Union Patriotica, Patriotic Union in, uh, in English. And in the 1986 election, the UP gains five, a historic 5% 5 of the national vote uh, they, um, in the presidential election. They actually win a number of uh, congressional and mayoral races all the way down the ballot. The violent response by MAS and other paramilitary groups was devastating and what led to the dissolution of the peace talks. Over the next decade, over 3,000 registered UP members were assassinated, including two presidential candidates. All of them were murdered by paramilitary groups. An investigation by Colombia's Attorney General concluded that among 162 leaders of MAS, the probably the largest paramilitary group at that time, they were able to identify 59 as active duty military officers. These officers included the names of the commanders of the Barbula and Bobona battalions, which is um, the, the battalions that covered the jurisdiction where Mas was based out of. And, um, you know, really, I say that just to show th this, you know, symbiotic relationship between paramilitary groups and the state. There, there, was, there wasn't one without the other. They were a lot of times be under the, you know, uniforms, uh, the same people. So, uh, what transformed, so during this time, the nature of paramilitary groups as mutually reinforcing institutions with the state remained the same. What transformed was the primary creators of paramilitary groups. So what it had been previously was a state strategy with elite sector support during this time became an elite sector strategy with state support. And that takes us to our third part. So this is the third moment, I call it the third that I want to talk with you tonight. Um, and that's the point of ascension. At least that's what I call it. And what this is about is, is about a man from one of the most wealthy landowning families of Medellin um, being really the embodiment of the inextricable relationship between the state and paramilitary groups and what led to their ultimate ascension. Because um, Alvaro Uribe, as you'll see right here with George Bush and on this uh, poster as governor of Antioquia, which uh, the large city Medellin is located in, um, through decree created the Community Rural Surveillance Association known by its acronym Convivir. These associations could react immediately to support the armed forces as well as gather intelligence and kill intelligence and kill any suspected rebel sympathizers. Um, emphasis on suspected, right? And Uribe had thus created Convivid and as an exact replica of the original paramilitary groups designed in the 60s. This not only increased the number of paramilitary groups in the region, but it also directly benefited Uribe himself, who still owned large swaths of land. And most interestingly enough, um, you'll see him here 
a close friend of the U.S. Well, in 1991, he was identified in the U.S. intelligence report as 82nd of 104 of the most important Colombian drug traffickers. So once Uribe becomes president, he's able to complete the ultimate fusion of paramilitary state and state structures through the false, what I claim to be false, demobilization um, or peace process with the AUC. So the AUC at this point in Colombian history is now the, the biggest paramilitary group. It's not even in itself a paramilitary group as it is a confederation of um, paramilitary groups from across the country. Of, uh, sorry, 50 paramilitary blocks scattered across 28 of the 32 departments of Colombia. Departments being what they call states. So in 2002, Oribe initiates a peace process with the top commanders of the AUC. And in 2006, 24,000 were reported, uh, 29,000 combatants had officially demobilized. However, in the two years follow, following the, the demobilization, there was a 25% increase in forced displacements and a 71% increase in the murder of unionists. What Uribe had orchestrated was a negotiation of constituents of, of the same system, not a peace process. Because really a peace process would be impossible when the AU, because the AUC and the state were never at war with each other. So what peace are they, are they, are they negotiating? Um, so the goal wasn't justice, the goal was the adaptation and legalization of paramilitary structures. And this was done in a number of ways. So Decree 128 of 2003 granted amnesties to paramilitary fighters not under investigation for human rights violations. 90% of all fighters have been parted under this decree. For those leaders that have been convicted of crimes against humanity, the government high commissioner for peace stated that, that the government is seeking punishment other than prison. The Justice and Peace Law passed in 2005 limited the maximum number sentence to a duration of eight years. And really the impunity goes further. The confessions that are given are vague and arranged as they do not give any concrete information and focus on dead, imprisoned, or missing paramilitary leaders. So what they in effect do is leave all current paramilitary state networks intact. Uh, and we're really seeing the effects of that today. Um, so it should be no surprise that Uribe and the political movement that surrounds him, known as Uribismo, Uribe, Uribeism in English, um, is such a supporter of paramilitary integration because an investigation in 2007 demonstrated atypical that was um, investigating atypical voting patterns and ir irregularities revealed collusion between paramilitary groups and politicians that implicated. 40% of the Colombian Congress. Almost all of those implicated belonged to political parties that endorsed uh, Uribe's campaign. So th this moment in paramilitary history is not one of demobilization, but of its ultimate political integration. So before I move to the present situation, I just want to sum up paramilitary history by saying this. I think this brief overview of the history of paramilitary state cooperation clearly demonstrates that paramilitary groups give the Colombian state, ruling class, what have you, a rarely seen flexibility and neutralizing challenges to its economic and political power. The exact na nature of this relationship is constantly evolving, but the central function of dispossession re and repression, which permits any form of self-subsistence and squashes any activism, that may lead to a more class conscious workforce. By providing this basis for capitalism, for capital accumulation, pa um, paramilitaries serve as a key, uh, an essential force in reproducing these social relations. And the reason this is so important is because capitalists in other countries have noticed. Right now, we see it m more, most acutely in Honduras with the model being exported there. Um, so really, the need for the, this history, the study of paramilitary groups goes beyond identifying solutions to Colombia's own borders, within Colombia's own borders, but um, economic crises across the globe. So to pick up where I left off, Uribe is the paramilitary leader himself who became president, right? Uh, but in 2010, his term limits are up. He tried to change that. He wanted to be president forever, uh, but he couldn't. And his deputy, essentially, his minister of defense, just like Novoa in the 60s, Becomes, um, becomes president uh, with the blessing of Oribe. That he's, his, he's his guy. 
What's interesting though is he ends up moving slightly to the political center. He opens up negotiations again with the FARC and, uh, in 2012, and by 2016 there's a tentative agreement for an end to this decades-long war. Um, well, it's tentative because they needed to get a um, plebiscite, is it in English? They needed to vote, yeah, plebiscite, to, um, to approve it. So at this point, uh, in 2016, Uribe has for forsaken Santos as a soft liberal. Their no friendship ended over. And um, he's created a new political party and coalesced the right-wing sector around himself um, and campaigned against this peace deal. But nonetheless, in December 2016, the peace deal signed and the war is officially over. So it's in the context of that research I showed with you and, um, and this, peace, this historic peace process taking place that I um, participated in a human rights delegation. We, we arrived in Cali, which was our base, just after an attack that had occurred on the pro progressive legislator, who thankfully survived. For, uh, for Cali, um, after that, each and every place we visited ex had experienced political killing just before or after, it, and in some cases even during our, our visit. Uh, we arrived in the area of Corinto and Miranda, a few days after the killing of a young indigenous leader by Colombia's anti-disturbance squad, their SMAT, essentially their riot police, um, on June 14th. We then went to the village of San Antonio above the urban center of Hamundi the very morning that a local community leader was killed. At that, that meeting, uh, it was in this, uh, their, essentially their church, the village church, this large room, and we were told by people that there were actually paramilitaries in attendance. So part of it was gathering uh, testimonies. That was a big part of our trip. So we actually had to take uh, the testimonies in a hidden location while the participants of the delegation just kind of took turns speaking, distracting the group um, while, we could, while we could do that because of that paramilitary presence. Um, then we went to Alvida, a village in the mountains, the Naya region, which is a historic, where there have been some historic massacres by paramilitary groups. Um, and as we were got there, the community was just learning of a killing the day before. There were, one happened that morning, and by the end of the day, as we were leaving, another one took place. The day after, they, they WhatsApped us saying that they found another body. We then went to Buenaventura, which is the largest coastal city on the Pacific coast of Colombia, west of Cali, um, which has the most abject poverty that I've ever seen in my life. Um, it's the, also the, you, the racist element of Colombian capitalism, of, I mean, ca capitalism everywhere is like that, but the um, Buenaventura is basically like 99% Afro-Colombian. That's where the Afro-Colombian population is concentrated, also happens to be the most impoverished, um, and the repression there from paramilitary groups has also been very significant. Uh, one of our guides, Rodrigo, oh. so that, that was a group that was one of the uh, kind of, when we were collecting testimonies, this is Buenaventura. I, tr I try to still like find the beauty in these very depressing topics. This is probably the best picture you could get of <laughs> Buenaventura. This is, uh, I'm taking it from the hospital that serves over 500,000 people, just, just one tiny hospital. This is, this is Rodrigo Vargas. He's a leader of the Permanent Human Rights Committee in Cali. He told us a really, uh, another event that's unfortunately all too typical. CPDH had been giving a workshop at Alvida's school, one of the villages we visited, on how to document human rights abuses. Suddenly the school itself came under fire by the Colombian armed forces who claimed they were battling guerrillas. Rodrigo, at great personal risk, went out and took photos and video footage of the military firing randomly into civilian areas while there were no insurgents to be found or seen. This was not a battle. It was another arbitrary attack by the state against the people it was supposedly sworn to protect. Rodrigo noticed two people among the Colombian armed forces who appeared to be fair-haired foreigners. This would make sense uh, because the 27th uh, Brigade of the Colombian armed forces is stationed in this area. It's notorious for its abuses, and many of its officers have been trained at the School of the Americas. The U.S. government has poured over $12 billion into equipping, training, and advising Colombia's military, police, and security apparatus. And um, it operates on seven different military bases in Colombia. So we were also there for the 2008, 2018 presidential election. Um, this was when now Santos's uh, 
uh, terms are up. Uribe has found a new candidate in Ivan Duque, his new protege, who's campaigning on getting on ending the peace deal, you know, back to war. And there's a leftist political candidate, Gustavo Petro, who for the first time has actually advanced the second round. Um, it, a leftist has really, it's always been between, you know, um, neoliberal centrist and a, and a conservative. So it was a really historic moment. Um, and I want to get into all of the irregularities that we witnessed that day, but I'm, I'm running out of time. And I'll, I'll just say this, you can see, well, there's a little, I have my lanyard on, but I, as someone who, you know, looks somewhat Colombian, didn't put on all the credentials that my other delegation uh, uh, mates had. They, uh, I just went in normal street clothes, walked around the polling places, and twice I was approached to um, see how, how, what I'd be willing to sell my vote for. Um, so, yeah, um, this, this is Colombia. This isn't, this isn't um, you know, Venezuela, depending on, on your views. There isn't uh, a lot of positivity in, my, in the story I shared with you. I, I acknowledge that. I, I'm a big Game of Thrones fan. Uh, and if, you know, Tyrion Lannister once says, if you think there's a happy ending, you haven't been paying attention. Um, so, but what I, what I want to end with is this. When I'm, um, when I'm in Colombia, it's so rare that I find anybody who uh, pities themselves or you know, thinks about how awful their, their situation is. And, um, that's, and, and, I, and I see it because not, that's not what the time is about. This isn't, uh, this isn't a night where, this isn't a story where you come in here and say, oh, that's, that's so terrible, like poor Colombians. Um, I don't, we, don't, we don't want sympathy, that's not what we want tonight. Because the truth is, is that everyone in this room is being screwed by the same system, okay? The, maybe we're not facing assassinations, or, you know, loved ones being displaced, but if one of us gets sick, there's a good chance, you know, there's a chance that we could go into bankruptcy. The same system, the same uh, money that is going to clump, the Columbian government who funds paramilitary groups, who carries out these atrocities, could be going to our hospitals, our schools, um, our roads. All of this is connected. The, pe the people of Colombia, the people of Venezuela, the people of the United States have much more in common with each other than they do the Trumps, the Uribes, the Duques, even the Santoses, all these people that I've, that I've talked about today. So the best thing that, in my opinion, we can do to, uh, sh to be in solidarity with our Colombian brothers and sisters, the uh, you know, thousands of martyrs that I've uh, talked about here tonight is struggle for democracy, justice, peace, equality in our communities just as they are in theirs. I'll stop there. Thank you.